I know what you're thinking. Socially distanced auditorium, exponential graph showing the UK, the USA, and Sweden right at the top. You could be forgiven in 2020 if you're sitting there thinking, he's going to talk about the disease, right? Well, if we put our selective attention bias to one side, you'd actually be half right. But this outbreak did not start in the last 12 months. Loneliness is not a new affliction. In fact, many years before her death, Mother Teresa said that loneliness was the most dangerous of all human diseases. And whilst we must be careful to not confuse loneliness with aloneness, as we can see here, there is a rapid rise in the number of people who are going to be living on their own. And therefore, we could be expecting to see a new social epidemic appear on the horizon. The data suggests we are not there yet. However, we should begin to prepare now for this new challenge, connecting people and supporting those who are either living alone or who will no longer get their sense of belonging from their household unit. We can't rely on governments to provide this solution, so we must, as members of the community, stand up and look for ways that we can provide this. And where better to learn how to do this than in our schools? Now, schools are a microcosm of the society that they serve. However, in one area, they are coming up short. Whereas a well-functioning civil society encourages us to stand up, speak out, and take action, schools have often been guilty of being one-way streets, where the flow of information, ideas, and direction comes purely from the teachers to the students. So, how do we address this? Well, it wasn't actually always that way. Back in 350 BC, Plato actually ensured there was student representation in his academy. And he did this through a rotating leadership of students elected by a secret ballot. We can look to modern education. John Dewey, the American philosopher in 1917, who wrote about the inclusion of democracy in our schools. And many schools listened, and I think you'd agree that it's hard to go to any school in Europe, America, or international schools and not find a student council sitting alongside the adult equivalent. So problem solved, right? Wrong. In a recent study of 66,000 students, 40% still claimed that they felt they had little or no voice. And one third of students said they felt persistent, painful feelings of loneliness. So why is this? Well, if we look at student councils, they actually suffer the same practical problems that our adult equivalents do. For example, although the election and the campaigning is really exciting, it often gets reduced to a beauty pageant or a popularity contest. And as a result, when the party's over, students often complain that they're no longer given the time and space not only to meet as a leadership committee, but to meet with their constituents to listen to new problems and bring those up the chain. Student leaders are rarely given the training they need. And as a result, if you attend a student-led meeting, they often struggle to get past the first item on the agenda and just descend into long conversations about problems with the school canteen or inadequate toilet facilities. Some students do say that they are invited to discuss media issues. However, again, they sometimes feel it is merely a tick box exercise and they are just there to rubber stamp a decision that has already effectively been decided by those higher up. As a result, some researchers say that student councils may do more harm than good to, uh, to the students because it actually reaffirms that authentic student voice remains out of reach. Now, that's not true of all student councils, and many of those practical implications could be addressed. But there does remain two structural issues that are much harder to escape. The first is a construction bias. And by this I mean, who was it that set up the design and structure of your student council? Was it the students that decided how many representatives there would be? 
how you would be elected and what would be your remit? Very often the answer is no. And this leads to a second problem, a form of state capture or self-fulfilling prophecy. As a result of this, many students aren't interested in student councils. And those that are, are those who are already thriving under the status quo and therefore have a lot of their own social capital already. So this means that even in the best schools with a fully functioning student council, there remains representational blind spots. Now, it's not just schools that report this problem. And Ernesto Sorelli, in his fantastic TED talk on sustainable development, said that the smartest, most passionate local people don't go to community meetings. He was talking about student entrepreneurs. And he, his solution was to take to the streets to find them. Now, I think that our solution looks slightly different in schools. I picture this as the neurons in a brain, where only part of the mind is firing, and other elements lay dark and dormant. And our solution is to create new pathways for students to engage in their school, firing them up and bringing the school to life. I believe there are three ways that we can do this. The first is to encourage and foster student-led social enterprises. Now, entrepreneurs, by their very nature, are always looking around for opportunities to meet consumer demand. And student entrepreneurs are uniquely placed to be able to listen and understand the needs of their peers. And there is no better incentive than profit and cash to be able to motivate them to meet this goal. However, if we ask them to set their business up as social enterprises and require them to give something back, then not only does that create a bond with their, with their school community, but gives them that sense of meaning. I'll give you an example. Up here in this picture, it's quite blurry because I took it while I was being pu pushed by a throng of students trying to get to the front of a sale of uh, house hoodies before the stocks ran out. Now, the students at the heart of this, this was not their first business venture. And in fact, their empire also contained a bricks and mortar shop that sold stationery and snacks and a suite of smart vending machines uh, littered across the school. Now, what was interesting is at the heart of this were six students, two generations of final year students, one passing the leadership to the next. And only one of those six was also a formal member of the school prefect team. In fact, three were also identified as students of concern at the start of their high school years. However, through their engagement with the community by setting up these businesses, by the, le by the time they left, they're in a very different position. And that wasn't just because of how successful they were at meeting consumer demand, but it was how thoughtful they were in the ways they gave back. To the senior students, they had a free fruit bowl in the IB common room every day. To junior school, they sponsored remote control cars for a STEM project. And they even funded 16 hardwood benches and chairs to create an outdoor canteen space as their legacy when they left. A second pathway for students is to consider passing over the running, development, and delivery of community events from our staff to an empowered student body. Now, it's not new to have a committee to set up uh, the school prom, but why stop there? From discos to the sports day, the entire intramural or house competition would be better run by an empowered student body. Now, the key to getting this right is to ensuring it is as close to 100% run by students as possible. Now, unfortunately, this means that you will face the brunt and the pain and the stress that comes with delivering a project on time and to budget. But it is the students that will soak up all of those plaudits when they run a successful event. And hopefully this fires them up to not only deliver more at school, but when they leave. Finally, the third pathway is for schools to not just allow, but to actively encourage student activism in whichever form they want it to appear. Student-written solutions are the most authentic feedback that we have. And not only empowers that student, but those around them who may be suffering 
in silence. One student I know set up a group called Girl Talk, which was a safe space for students to attend to talk about uh, issues at school. Now, she insisted to have no advertising except for word of mouth. And she felt that was essential so that those who may want to attend understood that it was separate from other official school uh, committees and organisations. Within two months, two members of the LGBT community approached her and asked how they could set up their own space. Six months later, not only did they have this, but they had secured funding from, for the student leaders to receive counselling so they were, better, uh, they were better able to advise younger students who were approaching them with problems. So, what do schools do if they want to foster this sort of culture that is conducive to this type of student agency? I think there are four things. The first is to set them the challenge. I think schools should consider writing a second student mission statement that sits alongside the schools. But this one should put the students right at the centre and define you as active change agents within it. And then you should be tasked with becoming that change agent. Secondly, schools should just say yes. Say yes and clear the path. Rather than dishing out the red tape and putting out hurdles for students, schools should make it a policy to say yes to all student-led initiatives that they come up with and instead reassign their administrators for working out what roadblocks need to be cleared to give the students the best chance of success. Thirdly, why don't we consider repositioning staff leaders to become consultants and coaches for students? Our schools are filled with adult experts who can help with finance, marketing and organisation. And they can act in the same way as incubator organisations do for startup companies. And in doing so, that student has a staff champion whenever they may need to call on it. Now finally, I believe that schools need to be mindful that success should not be judged by the outcome, but by the process. This is my final point, but I think it should be the first words that come out of a school's mouth. Business research shows that many firms fail to harness the creativity and entrepreneurial spirit of their employees because they only um, celebrate successful ideas after they've become successful. And the cost of failure is too big for many to put up their hand. So schools need to be mindful of this. We need to celebrate a new student idea as soon as it's initiated and celebrate it again in the early stages. Not only should this motivate the student to stay the course, but it should fire up those around them to put their good ideas into practice. As a result of following these four steps, I believe we can create richer school communities, full of students that have a greater sense of belonging to their school and are better equipped to find that sense of belonging in their wider communities. And through belonging, we can begin to cure loneliness. Thank you.